Um, let's get straight stuck into Isaiah, um, an absolutely amazing passage. We're going to dig a little bit deeper into waiting and uh, hope in the waiting and how we can have that, be confident of it, rekindle it if we've lost it. Let me just move this up a little bit. Is that all right? Would that be better? Hi. Okay. So here we go. Isaiah 9, 1 to 7. This is what we're going to be digging into today. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Amen. So, uh, if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to find Isaiah 9. Um, I will meet you there. Not just yet, but I will meet you there. So if you'd like to, find Isaiah 9, verses 1 to 7, and we'll all get there eventually, I promise you. So hope in the waiting, that's our theme for today, and it would be an amazing subtitle for the whole of the book of Isaiah, because it was written to a people who were hopeless, who were walking in darkness, and they needed their prophets, those who had direct communication with God, to give them hope. And we'll we'll find out more about that in a bit. But I want to make sure we engage with this passage as much as we can as we look at this this morning. And I need to ask you two questions that the whole service so far has been leading you towards. And it's these two here. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? And probably the length of time it's taken me to read that question, you already know, really. And then secondly, where does your hope come from? Because I think all waiting, actually, is done in hope, or we wouldn't bother waiting anymore. We wait, hoping that our highest hopes come at the end of that time, rather than our deepest fears. And that's true, whatever we're waiting for. If we're waiting for the bus, then we are hoping for its arrival. And the question that waiting asks is, where does that hope come from, that the waiting is worth it? Where are you getting that hope that keeps you waiting? And that's true whether it's in the short term, um, your, your fear that the, the longer the wait goes on for the bus, the bigger your fear that you're going to end up walking home rather than getting the bus. But it's true for the deeper and longer and more important things too, um, whether you're waiting for maybe a new job, a new relationship, a reconciliation, a diagnosis, a, a dream to be fulfilled a health treatment, the pain of grief to fade, a change in circumstances, or something even deeper and more existential than that. So what is it you're waiting for? But it's probably more than one thing. There might be a short-term thing. You may be waiting for Christmas, or you may be waiting for Christmas to be over. And there's probably something longer term, maybe. You're waiting for your family to share your faith. Or perhaps you're waiting for a family to share your faith with. So where does that hope come from? Is it your faith? Or is it medical science? Is it the 
bottom of a bottle or something else that numbs that pain of waiting? Is it the internet? Is it a faith in human kindness? Is it winning the lottery? I don't list any of those off with any sense of judgment, just to encourage you to be honest with yourself and with Almighty God as we head into this passage, because this passage is good, good news. And its light is very, very bright. And that's probably not surprising because order out of chaos, light in darkness, that's what God does. That's his favoritest thing. I, I read once that if you take a passage out of the Bible, you should be quite careful to put it back where you got it from. So that is what I'm going to do now and just lead us into this passage in Isaiah because I think it's really important to understand the context in which it was first declared because that will affect how we can take it and as Claire says, how we can then live it out. So light, the very first words that God ever spoke in the Bible, those four words, let there be light. They sum up God's mission in the pursuit of whole of humankind to have close relationships with each one of us. And there are key moments in that journey from those first words to the very end of Scripture where God overcomes darkness by his light shining, beginning with that very first moment in creation when God's kingdom was established and then at the end of time when there will be no need for the sun because of the glorious, uninterrupted presence of the Lord Jesus being light for all. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. So Genesis then tells the story then from that moment of creation through Adam and Eve and the darkness of sin, through Noah and the darkness of the flood, but the light of the rainbow and the hope that comes after. And then there's God's covenant with Abraham that kind of lights the pilot light on God's promised people that will then never, ever go out. Abraham is to be the start of that chosen people, not chosen in the sense of being favorites at the expense of everyone else, but being chosen to be an example to everyone else of God's goodness and faithfulness and love. Just like the churches today, we're not here to gather together in our little clubhouse and feel that we're all okay, but we're here to be an example to be shown what it means to be chosen by God is to be loved and to be cared for and to have that hope in the waiting and then to be the light to the world that are living in darkness. So the rest of the Old Testament is the story of that chosen people and then the New Testament becomes the story of hope for the whole of humankind coming out from that chosen people in the person of Jesus. So Abraham had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob, who had the 12 sons, um, who were the leaders of the tribes of Israel. And then because of Joseph, they ended up in Egypt and ended up being enslaved to the pharaohs until Moses was raised up and led them out into the promised land eventually. So by the time we get to Isaiah, Israel's been in that promised land for about 700 years. And for the first 400 years, they were ruled by judges and spiritual leaders and military or political leaders, many of whom's names you would know. And God raised these up as occasion demanded. And then for about 120 years, we have the rule of the three famous kings. We have Saul and then David and then Solomon. But then a series of kings where it didn't quite work out. And uh, in about 917 BC, Israel had a civil war. And that split the kingdom into two. You had Israel to the north and you had Judah to the south. And Jerusalem was in the southern kingdom of Judah. And this is where Isaiah lived. Now the words of Isaiah are given to these people as a promise to hold on to. And if you do get a chance to read the book of Isaiah, what you will see is that it alternates between God making really clear the consequences of not holding on to his word. And the consequences of not being faithful to him. And a promise that he would not abandon them and the whole of humanity to the consequences of their actions. For the generations who had been faithful to their God, but were still walking in darkness, Isaiah was declaring words of hope because their human government was unjust and burdensome and the impression was great and the longer the waiting went on the more desperate the prophets became for something to change 
And Isaiah makes clear in the whole of the book that there will be an end to it. He offers that hope, but not just for the short term, but for the bigger picture of whole humanity. And there's that zooming in to the now and the zooming out to eternity that echoes uh, the experience of our own lives and our own faith. And without wanting to stretch it too far, you can find that zoom in to the needs of the now and the zoom out to the whole of eternity, even within the structure of Isaiah itself. So it has 66 chapters, which is the same number of chapters as there are books in the Bible. And they're usually split into two sections because they're very different genres of writing. You have uh, chapters 1 to 39, and then you have chapters 40 to 66, which means there are 39 chapters in the first section, the same number of books as there are in the Old Testament. And there are 27 in the second, which is the same number as there are in the New Testament. And the beginning of that section in, in chapter 40 begins with the prophecy about the birth and the ministry of John the Baptist, which of course is how the New Testament starts. I think it's also helpful to remember what the name Isaiah actually means. It means the Lord is salvation. And as you read some of the more difficult parts of Isaiah, it's important to remember that, that all of this is focused on God's mission to give hope in the waiting. The prophecies Isaiah detail, the Lord's anger at what the people have become, the consequences of their behavior, Through it all is God's plan to bring salvation to them, not just in the short term, but to the whole of humanity in the long term through the promise of this Messiah. Now, as Isaiah's ministry began, so in the context of this book, there's a national crisis in the northern nation of Israel. And the book details Isaiah's prophecy at different points warning people about the consequences of forsaking God and the promise of God's faithfulness to those who put their faith in him. If you read the bit before we read this morning, then you'll read um, the plea to hold on to God's word and not look elsewhere for hope. Um, One of my areas of waiting at the moment, I've shared with you a few times, my mum is in a nursing home down in Kent. I'm going down on Wednesday and we're going to decorate her room for her third, last Christmas because there never seems any possibility that she will make it to the next one and yet in the Lord's mercy his ordination I use different words depending on how I'm feeling here she is and every time I go down I read with her Psalm 130 and in there is the verse we wait on the Lord my whole being waits and in his word I put my trust. And we are waiting on the foundation of my mum's faith in his word through her whole life. And that's what I am waiting for with her in hope that that word is true. And that's what Isaiah is declaring to the people. Wait in God's word. And the very first word of our passage is a pivot word from those dire warnings to the hope and joy of the promised salvation of the Messiah, which is why we read that first verse. The word is nevertheless. And it's a very important word for us as Christians to hold on to, that whatever else is going on in our lives, nevertheless, God is good. His promises are true. And he is faithful. So all the desperate words, all the laments, everything that's been leading up to this point in the book does not negate God's intention to act and his promise to rescue. And the passage as we look through it goes through a series of progressions beginning in the first verse. So listen out to which ones might resonate with what you're waiting for and how you are feeling about that waiting, how much hope you have. So in this first verse, Isaiah says there's a shift in where hope and light can be found. The places where there had been safety and prosperity, that might no longer be the case. But those places that have been barren and desolate and deserted, they will now become places of light and hope. So can I encourage you, if if you get nothing else out of this time this morning... Can you commit across Advent to pray for a place that is a place of darkness where our brothers and sisters may be across the world are encountering difficulty 
and are waiting for hope and light. Go to the Open Doors website um, and find some place that resonates with you that you can really pray into over this time of Advent. Or go to your local newspaper, uh, your local website, and find a neighborhood that is constantly cropping up and seems to be a place that is struggling for light to shine and commit to pray for it. Get into twos or threes and go prayer walk it may be. There might be other situations in your life which just seem dark and desolate and abandoned. Advent is a time to pray that the light will shine, that these places that seem hopeless, their waiting ends and they are filled with hope. Then verse 2 tells us that darkness will be replaced with light. It will be like the coming of the dawn, bringing relief, not just in the short term, but in doing so, shining a promise in the long term for prosperity across the land. And we get some details of that in verse 3. This is going to be like a national celebration. The nation will be established. It will be enlarged. There will be celebrations on a national scale, just as if they'd won a victory against an enemy or were celebrating all the crops being safely gathered in. And these are two symbols of being safe, safe from enemies who may attack, and safe from hunger, starvation, and poverty. They will be safe. They will be well fed. I wonder if you're waiting to feel those. I wonder if you're feeling insecure or unsure how you'll make ends meet. Well, there is hope. There is also practical help in this place. And I know that Claire and the leadership would want me to say, do not leave today without talking to someone if you are feeling insecure or you really don't know how to make ends meet. Verse 4 tells us that not only will they be safe and nourished, but they will be free from oppression. The burdensome rule over them will be ended. More than that, it will be shattered beyond repair. They will no longer be slaves to those who are currently their masters. Are you waiting for that? I wonder if you're feeling constrained by someone or something and you're waiting for that sense to be lifted, that sense of freedom. There is hope. In verse 5, there's the promise that this will not be the short-term fix. So secure and safe will they be, so established in their national security. Soldiers, you can burn your boots. You won't be needing them. I wonder if you're waiting for that sense of struggling to be over. Do you feel battle-weary? Are you longing for peace? There is hope. All these verses, in fact, across the whole of the book, comes the promise that those who wait in hope will be satisfied. And in the next two verses come those famous words, which we understand with the whole of Scripture, and not just about a king like David, which the people would have interpreted as such. We understand this is Jesus, someone who was not only able to bring peace and nourishment and safety and security to a patch of land in the Middle of East but was actually able to bring to the whole world that promise across the whole of time. And even more miraculous than that, he is able to bring those things to me and to you right here, right now. We look to Christmas to remind us that Jesus came to all these things, that no matter what the year behind, has brought us, no matter what the year ahead has laid up for us. There is a light that will always shine in the darkness and the darkness will not overcome it, as John puts it in his gospel. But we wait for even more than that. We are waiting longer for this light to come again. This Jesus will return and in doing so, he will bring his holy and intense light that will shine and expose all the darkness in the world, all the darkness in our hearts. And there will be no hiding from it, which should make us tremble. 
It's like when kids are messing around in the darkness of their bedroom. The parent comes in, opens the door, turns on the light. Everything becomes exposed. I could tell you some stories. If you understand that this is the almighty God, the creator of the universe, and that thought of waiting doesn't instill in you awe and maybe some fear, then you don't understand. Unless, unless we are hoping for this light. Unless we are hoping for this light to finish in this world what has already started in our hearts. That this light, the light of life, that brings us new light out of the darkness of the resurrection tomb in which we have already died along with those dark corners of our soul that have already been redeemed by Jesus' work on the cross. That moment in history where there was no light, where the sun was blotted out and the earth went dark and Jesus went through that horror of darkness on our behalf. But in that moment, he declared it was finished. In that moment of his deepest darkness, for the rest of us, the waiting was over. And that pilot light of hope burst into flame, never, ever to be extinguished again. So what are you waiting for? Well, there are going to be as many answers to that as there are people in the room. I know that. But where does your hope come from? I think there are only two answers. Either your hope is in that child that was born, the one on whom the light shines, the wonderful counsellor, almighty God, Prince of Peace, everlasting Father, the one who we call Jesus. Either your hope is in him or it's not. And if it's not, then I urge you to bring to him all your fears, all that you're waiting for, all the darkness in your life and in your heart. Come to him and let him say his favorite words. Let there be light. It won't bring an end to your circumstantial waiting, Waiting seems to be one of God's favourite ways to get his children to talk with him and spend time with him. Not for his sake, but for ours. But in that waiting, you will come to know the hope and the peace and the safety and the security and the nourishment that the blessing of being one of his children brings to the waiting. You won't have to fear that light. You will do what many of us do. You will pray for him to turn his face towards you that the light of his face may shine on you. It'll be the best Christmas present you ever have. So again, please don't leave this place without talking to Claire, one of the leaders, the friend you came with, anyone, about how to know that hope in your waiting. And if your answer is that your hope is in Jesus, then everything I've just said is true for you too. But it might not be enough to just tell you that. I'm at the moment going through one of my running phases. It comes in and out according to the weather. And when I get home from my running, I have, on my app, I have a chance to rate my run. So uh, I can put in a score of one to 10. One is I could go out and do that run straight away again. And 10 is putting in this score might be the last thing I do. Seven is quite challenging, hard to talk. I don't understand why the numbers one to six exist. Because I have never ever done a run in any state of fitness or health where it wasn't quite challenging and hard to talk. I don't understand why you could rate anything before that. So I wonder where your hopeometer is. If you had to rate your hope at the moment, one to 10, does it vary minute to minute, moment to moment, circumstance to circumstance? I guess it probably does depend on the severity, the importance, the desperation of what you're waiting for and how long maybe you've been waiting for it. 
I'm not going to be glib enough to try and answer those questions and to suddenly solve that problem. But what this passage says today is that your hope for the short term comes from your confidence in the promises of the long term. So in this period, in this run up to Christmas, can I ask you to read this passage and find in there the faithfulness and the promises that allow you to praise him for all he is, all he has done, and all his promises. Ask the Spirit to show you the truth of these words in the story of your own faith journey. Can you see too that you were once walking in darkness when the mercy of God was revealed and a great light shone into your life that allowed you to journey with him? As you walk today, are you aware of his light shining on you still? You could ask for eyes to see this. Those of you that find music and songs helpful, let me give you one. It's called Evidence. Evidence. It's by Josh Baldwin. You'll find it on all the major platforms. It might just help give words to that search for all that God has done in your life. Can you thank him for dawning in the darkness of your life? Can you remember when he was first born in your heart and you realised he had been given to you by his father? Will you trust him maybe again, his plans, his promises? Will you give him permission perhaps again to take governance of your life on his shoulders? As you pray, you can spend some time reading the titles he's given, turning them into praise for all he is and what he means to you. Tell him he's wonderful. Ask him to be your counsellor, your faithful friend. Praise him as almighty God, an everlasting father. Ask him to be the prince of peace in your life. Because this time next year, if you come to the morning service, the first Sunday of Advent, you will be waiting. It may not be for what you're waiting for right now, but you'll definitely be waiting for something. But the hope that comes from the promise that unto us a child is born is that hope in our waiting that unto us a son is given. That promise that we were once walking in darkness, but now we've seen a great light. So may that light shine in us and onto us and out of us. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.